guess it's time to learn rock. <laughs> So as a Python dev and as an aspiring game dev, the first thing I realized is how much other programmers laugh when you tell them that you want to make games in Python. Hello, hello. I see you apply for the programming job. Okay, okay. First tell me about yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. So I've been making games since- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you use to make game? Unreal? Unity? Oh. I code in Python. You f alien. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not exactly how it goes, but that's sure how I remember it. However, as someone who's been around the voxel dev cube, I notice a lot of programmers gravitating towards using Rust for high performance, as well as this new cool game engine of the future, Bevy. So I decided to give it a shot. I mean, it can't be harder than C++, right? Right? Ah, uh, never mind, let's get started. Okay, so to start, I downloaded Cargo and the Rust compiler. Then, I proceeded to make the best program of all time. <laughs> okay, time to add this to my resume. 10 years of Rust development. Okay, after that, I just decided to make Wordle since it was my first Python project and it helped me to learn Python quickly. So, if you want proof that I'm not a good programmer, Here's what the Python script looked like. Yikes. So with the help of ChatGPT, I quickly got an input system working and moved on to the word analysis. One thing I would like to say about the language is how clean the syntax is. While C++ and Python have literally the worst possible syntax for declaring variables, Rust takes on a much cleaner approach with the let keyword and colons for variable types, which I actually like a lot. I mean, I know this is not the only language that does this, but hey, cut me some slack here. Now, another thing that I like is a printing system, which is basically a default f-string in Python. And it basically forces me to know what I'm printing <coughs> in like another language. However, here I quickly encountered my first problem with the language, which is the borrowing system. When I pass a variable into a function in Python, only God knows what happens to this. But for C++, it usually copies the variable, unless it's a vector, then it gives a reference to it to prevent having to copy every element back into memory. This sounds great, but you start to realize how unclear it is whether something is being copied and what is being referenced. Rust takes a really nice approach to this though. You want a copy? We got you. Just put nothing and clone the variable. You want a reference? We got you. Just put an and. You want a mutable reference? We got you. Just put an and mute. To normal people, this doesn't seem like anything special, but for programmers, this is f***ing amazing since it lets the code become so much more readable. However, this did come with its hurdles of understanding strings. In Rust, there's a string type and an AND string type. What's the difference? I have no clue. So most of the time I rely on ChatGPT or the compiler to tell me what's the problem. Another thing that I've noticed would be mutability. In C++, all variables are mutable except constants. But in Rust, you have to explicitly declare whether a variable is mutable or not. Additionally, you're only allowed one mutable reference of a variable at a time. Doesn't sound that bad, right? <laughs> I'll talk about this later. Just know that I have a love-hate relationship with this. And when I mean love-hate, I mean I would voluntarily drown my partner if I ever got the chance. The last thing I noticed about Rust is its error handling system. Firstly, arrays can't be indexed with ints. They have to be indexed with something else called u sizes, which to this day, I still have no clue what it is. This does get annoying when I have to convert to a U size every time, but I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Then comes input handling. Input handling in Rust is like when a white woman goes into a Starbucks and you're the cashier. Hi, what can I do for you? Yeah, can I have a pumpkin spice latte? Yeah, sure. Okay, here's your pumpkin spice latte. Um, does this have regular milk inside it? I'm lactose intolerant, so could you change that to goat milk? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, I changed it to goat milk. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't have any gluten, right? Because I'm allergic. Ugh, okay, yes ma'am, I'll remake it again. 
Okay, ma'am. Will that be all? Also, could you make it vegan? I want to say the animal skin. I don't think the I world really deserves such a tastes. great Samaritan. Hello? Like Hello? Service worker? <laughs> okay, but anyways, after all that, I was able to get the world to work. At least partially. Next, I wanted to learn Bevy, so I quickly started up a new project and added Bevy using Cargo. Then, after writing the best program again, I compiled it. I mean, I know this is a meme, but to compile a Bevy project, it can take up to like 30 minutes. That's like waiting for GTA to boot up. Okay, when you put it that way. But after the first compile, the program does take a lot shorter to compile, so I guess it's not that big of a problem. A bigger thing that I noticed is that since Bevy is so new, it is getting constantly updated with new syntax. Why is this a problem? Well, ChatGPT gave me a lot of wrong information and old syntax, making it kind of unreliable to debug my code, which sucks because I can't debug it myself. So instead, I had to turn to online videos and GitHub discussions for help, but by far the most credible source is the Bevy cheat book and the main engine website. I mean, I'm telling you, if you have any question about Bevy, Either the cheat sheet or the website has you covered. But even with these resources, it's extremely difficult to learn the new things, and it took me an entire day to add text and states into my game. However, what I find interesting about Bevy is that it's truly a game engine rather than some graphics library. <laughs> In Bevy, similar to a lot of other game engines, there's something called an Entity Component System, or ECS. Now, I don't know much about what this is, but I do know that it allows the game to run much faster, which is the important part. The only problem being that in order to work with Bevy's ECS, we have to think differently. So for example, in Pygame, if I wanted to make 10 enemy entities, I would create an enemy class and then put it into a large list. However, in Bevy, I would make an enemy struct and give it a component attribute, then add this to the ECS with Bevy's command system. This sounds easy until you realize that everything has to be a component. If you want to add a global variable that keeps track of the score, we wouldn't declare a global <coughs> variable. Instead, we would spawn a specific struct that contains the score and add it to the ECS as a resource. Now, another thing that I noticed is that we can't add normal parameters to our functions. Instead, we have to use queries to get them from the Bevy ECS. One great thing about this is that we can filter the data with the with command. So for example, if we wanted to get all the enemies that are melee, we would do something like this. But one thing that sucks is that it's obscurity with mutability, like here. Yeah, it makes sense that I want a mutable reference, but why would we want the entire thing to be mutable? So like the string, I just throw my nonsensical code at the compiler or ChatGPT and make it fix it. But anyways, after that, I was able to make the game. The game is just a really simple Space Invader clone which helped me to learn the ECS as well as basic functions like drawing images and inputs. This was, at the very most, functional, but hey, it's a start. Moving on, I wanted to make a physics engine similar to the one I made in this video, which you should totally go check out by the way, but much faster. So I quickly made a ball struct and added some functions which allowed it to collide with the walls of the screen. But when I tried to make the actual ball collision, I encountered a problem. See, in my previous engine, ball collision worked like this. We have a list of balls, and we loop through every ball in the list. Then we loop through every other ball in the list again to check for collisions. Then if two balls are colliding, we edit both of the ball's positions to resolve the collision. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, yeah. If it weren't for the freaking rust ball checker to f everything up, remember how I said we could only have one mutable reference? Yeah. This means that we can only edit one of the balls at once. So we just resolve one ball at a time, right? But this presents another issue. If we resolve the collision for only the first ball, it would be moved out of the way and would no longer collide with the second ball. Then when we check the collision for the second ball, we would no longer find any collisions and thus effectively won't do any collision response. Essentially, only half of our balls actually have physics. Now, to fix this, we have to do something kind of dirty, which is to recreate the entire ball array from scratch. And now that we have two copies of the balls, whenever we want to perform collision resolution, we can only edit the first array of balls. But when we want to check for collisions, we use the data in the second array. Essentially, what this does is it takes a snapshot of the frame and does not actually update the position of the balls until all the balls have collided. Now, even though this is kind of dirty, since we have to implement chunking anyways, we would always have to loop through the balls at the start to get them into their respective chunks. So, at the very least, this is somewhat bearable. 
Also, something that I wanted to mention was how I originally tried spatial hash mapping, but at that point I was still storing references to the balls, so the Rust compiler kept complaining how the lifetime of the references weren't living long enough. So after 3 days of debugging, I eventually moved to a fixed size grid, which I realized it wasn't the fault of the hash map, but rather the way I was using it. <sighs> Learning can be such a joy sometimes. Anyways, after like 10 more bugs, I was able to get it working, like my other physics engine, but unlike my other physics engine, yeah. Also, unlike my other physics engine, this one's fast enough to support multiple simulation steps. In this case, I'm running 10, which might be slightly overkill, but it makes my simulation not fall into chaos even when the pressure is insanely high. Here's how it looks with different simulation steps if you were wondering. If you want to play around with the simulation, GitHub link always in the description. Lastly, yes, you heard the title right, I'm remaking my entire chess engine. Why you might ask? Well, the bigger question is why I didn't release the other one. Well... So yeah, if there's one thing I've learned from Rust, it is that sometimes the best thing to do is to start over. Now surprisingly, instead of taking me 4 months, remaking the entire chess engine only took about 3 weeks. Like you can actually go to the GitHub and see my commit history. It's honestly kind of amazing what you can do when you don't pay attention to math class. I mean, when you work very hard. Additionally, I remarkably didn't have any major errors except the move caching, where I had to learn about constant functions and data types. Oh. And I also try to optimize the assembly for a week straight to deal with the slow array indexing. That was fun. So other than the code being much, much cleaner, most of the systems are different. Mainly the board is now a struct rather than a class, and the pawn movement was cleaned up from this monstrosity to this. Like I said, very demure, very mindful. With this, it has a similar if not slightly better performance to my other chess engine of about 5 million nodes per second on my laptop. And after this, I added the display with Bevy, but instead of the blue and white color palette for C++, I made a red and white color palette for the colors of Rust. Other than this, I also made a move search on a separate thread, so it doesn't clash with the main thread and crash the entire game loop, which was a flaw of my Python chess engine. If you want to play the bot, you can look at the description, and it actually has an executable this time. So, yeah. Okay, now my final thoughts for Rust and Bevy. Firstly, I just want to say that I'm not a big fan. I mean, I love the language, and now it's my favorite language. It has the cleanest syntax I've ever seen, and the compiler is great. I also like, I mean, I love the simplicity of the cargo system and the entire Rust ecosystem, which is much better than the other high-performance language that I do. <laughs> for Bevy, I like how robust the system is, and I get why so many people love it. However, with that being said, let's talk about some of its downsides. Let's face it, Rust has a steep learning curve, like a really steep learning curve. Right off the bat, you're introduced to new concepts like mutability, pointers, references, memory safety, heap allocation versus stack allocation, and so much more. 
And although these are all great things to learn, to learn it immediately as soon as you enter a language is quite a tall order, especially to those who are new to programming. I've been programming for about two years now, and I can confirm that the transition from Python to C++ is much more forgiving compared to the transition from C++ to Rust, which really surprised me since they're both compiled languages. And for Bevy, it is no different. It was quite confusing to get used to the ECS, and even now I still have no idea what half of these attributes do, or what the spatial bundles do. Also, if you decide to learn it, I suggest that you get into contact with someone who actually knows their shit, because learning it by myself with so many outdated sources is really a pain. But with that being said, I'm still very new to the language and bevy, so maybe my view of it will change in the future. Feel free to share your thoughts of the language and experience in the comments below. Like always, the GitHub links will always be in the description. Please consider subscribing, and have a nice day. Bye!